it's this uh, little briefing, if you like, about VAT. Um, my name is Mark Shuttleworth. I've been at the VAT office now for a few years. Um, what I'm going to tell you about today uh, is um, give you a little background on what VAT is and how it works and how it might affect you. So we're going to cover what VAT is. Um, I'll explain what a, a taxable person is. We'll talk about taxable supplies, what they are. We'll look at VAT registration, what the VAT limits are, when you have to register. We'll talk about the VAT rates and VAT liabilities without going into too much depth because there's an awful lot there. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about VAT invoicing and the recovery of VAT. So if I start on what is VAT, VAT is a tax which is applied to the supply of all goods and services by a business which is in the Isle of Man or the UK and it must be made in the course or the furtherance of business. So that means it's got to be something that you're doing as a business activity. And it's also not specifically exempted. So the exemption is a part of the VAT liabilities which we'll come on to shortly. So what do I mean by a taxable person? A taxable person is any entity which is either a sole proprietor, it could be a partnership which can be made up of individuals or limited companies or a combination of both. And then finally, limited companies themselves which can cover things like PLCs, unlimited companies. Together, they are all taxable persons if they are either required to register or they are already VAT registered. So when are you required to register for VAT? Well, simply the VAT threshold is 85,000 at the moment, it has been for a few years. And why, why should I register? What, what's the benefit? Well, you might have to, so there's no, there's no choice there. But it might also be financially beneficial to you. It's possible that a lot of what you do is taxed at a, a reduced or a zero rate, whereas a lot of the supplies that you buy might be taxed at the standard rate. So you might end up in a position where you're actually claiming money back from the VAT office and not paying it to us. So when should I register for VAT? Well, obviously, if you've already gone over the threshold, then you have to do it and you have to do it straight away. But it, you can register even if you're trading below the VAT threshold to what we would call a voluntary registration. And again, you might do that voluntarily because it might be financially beneficial to you. You might get refunds rather than actually paying out. So if we look at taxable supplies, there are basically two types of supplies. There are those that are taxable and there are those that aren't. So taxable supplies are supplies which are taxed at either the standard rate of 20%, the reduced rate of 5%, or they're zero rated. And some people might say, well, if they're zero rated, there's no VAT on them. But they are, there's a subtle difference. They are treated as a taxable supply. And if you're making taxable supplies, that gives you an entitlement to register. The two non-taxable supplies are exempt, i.e. they're specifically mentioned in the VAT Act as being exempt from VAT. And there are also outside the scope supplies. Now those are things that you might provide goods or services to somebody who is outside the scope of VAT. So they are not taxable. If you're in a position where you're only making exempt supplies, you have no entitlement to register for VAT. So that is one difference between taxable and non-taxable. If we look at the VAT liabilities, as I've already mentioned, basically everything you buy or sell is taxed at the standard rate of VAT. But along with everything, there are exceptions. The exceptions are when it's specified as being reduced rated, which is in Schedule 1 of the VAT Act. They could be zero rated, which is in Schedule 9 of the VAT Act, or well, they could be exempt from VAT, they're in Schedule 10. So if something, a common question we get asked is, uh, is such and such taxable? Well, 
if it doesn't, if it isn't reduced rated or zero rated or exempt, then the answer is yes. There's no list of everything that is taxable. There are only lists of the things that aren't taxable at a standard rate. So if we look a little bit more detail at the tax rates, first of all, you've got the standard rate. That's thing that everything is, uh, everybody's aware of that. And basically it applies to all goods and all services that you pay, that you pay for, um, except of course where they're not. So the reduced rate of VAT, there's a reduced rate on children's car seats, for example, fuel and power. If you look at your electricity or your gas bills at home, they're taxed at the 5% rate. If you've got a business, they'll be taxed at the standard rate of 20%. Energy saving materials, this is a, an interesting one at the moment because last year HMRC uh, made energy saving materials zero rated, but only for a five year period. So that's to encourage people to put solar panels on the house, make sure it's properly insulated uh, by heat pumps and whatever. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. There is actually um, the the well. There are there's a wide range of VAT notices which are available. Uh, the energy saving materials notice is seven oh eight forward slash six. You find uh, all the uh, VAT notices available on the HMRC website. And if you just Google VAT notice and then the number, you should get uh, a link straight to it. The energy saving materials is actually quite restrictive. Uh, there's only a small number of items. As I say, at the moment, they're all zero rated. But in uh, April 2027, they will become 5% again. Um, one advantage we've got over here, uh, as opposed to in the UK, we've got our own reduced rate, which applies to both holiday accommodation and also domestic property repairs. So if you have any work done on your own house over here, you only pay 5% that. In the UK, they pay 20. And if you stay in a hotel here, you're only paying 5% that. If you stay in a hotel in the UK, you're going to pay 20%. So they're two little anomalies which are only uh, applicable on the Isle of Man. They're, in general terms, they're for things that we call non-exportable services. So the provision of holiday accommodation. You can't take the holiday accommodation away with you. You can only enjoy it here. So if we move, yes. Yes. We only look at um, the VAT threshold is a, a figure which is based over a 12 month period, yeah. but it's not a fixed 12 month period. It's a rolling 12 months. So we just move it on month by month, but we look back at the previous 12 months. And if you go over the 85,000 at any stage, yeah. then you have to register. Um, do we do, we do get, sorry. No, but obviously when you do have a, a, a big blip, if you like, like that, it can push you over the threshold for a short period of time. Now, there are rules that cover that. Um, if it's a one-off event, for example, you could actually get exception from registration. So you're actually saying, yes, I went over. Yeah, yeah. For example, you you, you ha have a concert and you sell tickets for it. That might take you over in that one event, but you're not doing it again in the next 12 months. Yeah. So we would look at on upon that and probably you would get exception from registration. There is also another thing with reg that registration called uh, exemption. Um, and that is if you're involved in mainly or wholly zero rated supplies. So for example, somebody has a children's clothing shop their sales may be well over the VAT threshold, but they can actually apply for exception from re exemption from registration. And that means that they don't have to be VAT registered because everything they're selling is at the zero rate. That's a special case. 
it, more than likely they're going to register anyway because they're going to be incurring a lot of VAT on freight and shipping for the, the goods that they're selling. They're also going to have a um, premises that they're selling from, so they're going to have the uh, heat and light and electricity in there, as well as the maintenance of the of the unit. So they're not going to uh, apply for uh, exemption on those grounds. So if we move on from the 5% rate, go down to the zero rate, common things here, we have already mentioned their uh, children's clothing, food, new houses. So if you buy a new house, you're paying that, but you're paying that at the zero rate. And there is a reason for that. That's so that the people who build the houses are actually in a position where they can be that registered and reclaim all of that on all the materials that they have to buy. If it wasn't taxed, they would, wouldn't be able to recover all those costs. Newspapers, books, transport. Newspapers and books are a slightly old fashioned thing now because most people look at the internet or they get ebooks. Uh, but the VAT, the VAT ruling is still there. Uh, transport is an area that people commonly get confused with. Transport is zero rated, public transport. And then if we look at one other rate, which is the exempt supplies, things like finance and insurance. Most of you will be familiar with uh, insurance, getting your car or a house insured. They're actually exempt uh, supplies that are being provided to you. It means that most insurance or finance companies can't actually register for VAT unless they also do something else, uh, which is taxable. Land is another area which is exempt from VAT, which is where we buildings and land and construction that can become quite a complex and involved area of that we're not going to cover that today it's not the, not the right time or the right audience so a very simple equation here of how that works so what we've got are some materials some timber and some screws um, and as a joiner I go out and buy these things and I pay VAT on my supplies I decide I'm going to build a table. So I build this nice table, I'm going to sell it. Now, if I'm VAT registered, obviously, I've got to charge VAT on that sale. But the advantage of that, if I'm VAT registered, is I'm in a position now where I can recover the VAT on the purchases, on the materials that I've purchased. So what you end up with is a little equation where the output tax, the VAT on your sales, that's the VAT you're actually paying to us. So you pay us £4 on the sale of the table, but you're then going to reclaim £3 on the materials that you bought to make that table. So you're actually only going to pay us a single pound. Somebody who's not VAT registered, he's not going to charge the £4 on his sale, but he's not going to be able to recover the £3 he spent on buying it. So... It's not true that VAT is an enemy of everybody. It does work for some people. It's to their advantage sometimes to be VAT registered. That's obviously a very simplified view of transactions. Ooh. Sorry, I thought I missed a slide there. One thing that you all get when you buy things is you'll get a VAT invoice. So... The important things to look for on a VAT invoice are the details of the person who supplied you the, the goods or services. So you should have their name and address, their VAT number. If there's no VAT number on a document, that is not a VAT invoice. And if somebody's charging you VAT and not quoting their VAT invoice, that's actually um, illegal. They must quote their VAT number if they're charging you VAT. If they're not VAT registered, they're actually committing an offence. They're creating what's called a debt to the crown. The other things that you'd need on an invoice, maybe the customer's name, description of the goods or the services that they're buying, and most importantly, the amount of VAT that they're being charged. It should, in some cases as well, also specify what rate of VAT you've been charged because there may be some, some invoices where you buy certain supplies which are taxed at one rate 
and there may be other supplies on there which are taxed at a different rate. So if you've got all those elements on an invoice and you're that registered, you're now in a position where you can reclaim the VAT that you've been charged and that you've paid. If you haven't got one of those, you can't claim the VAT back. You might have evidence that you've paid it, but you've got no evidence of what the VAT content was. Now, people make mistakes when they're claiming VAT back. Some of them are very common. Uh, they happen all the time. It, most regular things are people duplicating an entry in their records. So they put the same invoice in twice. It's very simply done. Um, and we're all human at the end of the day. So we're all, we're all capable of making those simple errors. But some of the things that people reclaim VAT on, like fuel, um, that you can claim VAT back on fuel. For commercial vehicles, that's absolutely fine. But when it comes to cars, there are certain rules to claim the VAT back on fuel in a car. You've got to pay what's called the scale charge or a CO2 emissions charge, which is how this now works out. And paying that fee, if you like, entitles you then to recover all of that on your fuel costs. Now, regardless of whether you pay that scale charge, any maintenance or repairs that are done to the vehicle can be reclaimed as long as the vehicle is used for business purposes. So if you've got a van for your business and your own family car, you can claim the VAT back on the fuel for your van, but the family car, you can't have any fuel back on that. And if you have any repairs done to the car, you can't have the VAT back on that either. Business entertainment, quite Another popular subject that people get wrong, they think that they can claim the VAT back if they take people out for fancy meals or to events or whatever. Um, that's true if they're staff. But if they're not staff, if you're taking clients out, you can't claim the VAT back on the client elements of that cost. And if you take wives of uh, staff out or uh, the, the partners, if you like, of your employees you can have the VAT back up to the employee's part, but not for the partner's part. Clothing. Um, if you have corporate clothing, uh, you'll have seen some of the DFE team, they're wearing corporate T-shirts today. They're a classic example of, of clothing that you would be allowed to recover the VAT on. If they were just wearing plain black T-shirts, there's nothing specific about them. They wouldn't be able to claim the VAT back. Uniforms, uniforms are a common um, area where you can reclaim VAT on. Um, I'll give you a quick anecdote. I once had uh, a VAT reclaim from a second-hand car dealer and he was claiming the VAT back on his shaver and his aftershave and his designer suit uh, because he claimed that they were all tools of the trade. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't correct and he didn't get his VAT back. Cars, uh, we've already mentioned cars, but people think that if they buy a car for their business, they can have the VAT back on it. Um, you can, but only if that car is exclusively for your business use only. If it goes to your home, you can't have the VAT on it. Um, if it's attributed to a single employee, you can't have the VAT back on it. It's got to be a genuine pool vehicle available for all of the business and kept at the business. Obviously, if you run a business from home, that poses some questions. But there are ways that we can look at it. If it's insured, for example, for business use only, we would tend to accept that. If you've got a company and the car is registered to the company, again, that's a, a factor that we would look at and consider. I've mentioned uh, transport already. Passenger transport is actually zero rated. So although you are paying VAT on it, it is VAT at the zero rate. People often mistakenly believe it's a VAT inclusive charge and they work out what the VAT element is and claim it back. Can't. I'm sorry, you can't. Uh, and finally, anything you buy, as long as it's used for business purposes. So 
you run a business where in your reception area you've got a TV screen which maybe shows current market values or something like that and you think I need a new TV and you see there's a, a deal going on where you can get two for the price of one and you think that's great I'll get get one for the business and I'll get a new one for home you know you'll get caught out it's got to be for business you certainly if you were to buy the TV genuinely I'm gonna take it home and not use it for the business there are two ways to address it you either don't claim the input tax in the first place or you claim it and then when you sell the TV to yourself because you're taking it from your business into your personal assets you would need to charge yourself VAT now that could be done at cost and that would be acceptable So those are some of the areas that people make mistakes in. And that covers a simple introduction. Um, obviously, if anybody's got any questions, ask away. If anybody would like to maybe speak to me afterwards, you know, in a more private uh, capacity, then you can do that as well. Contacts that you can see there are for some of my colleagues across Treasure. Um, there for some of my colleagues across uh, Treasury. I don't know why it went on to that next slide. Um, Apologise for that. But, yeah. Sorry. Um, quick question. You, you use a booking system, a software company based in Australia. They don't, they don't charge VAT. I'm assuming it just depends on the level of liability you've got with claiming the VAT. You can pay for the VAT. Right. If you, I mean, if you're talking about buying the booking system, then that would be if it was actually physical software which was brought over. Then that would be classed as an import. So you would pay that when the goods arrive in the UK. If it's provided to you electronically, then that would be what we call well, that would be a service. And there are rules for buying um, services from outside the UK. They're called the reverse charge rules. And effectively what you do is you charge the VAT to yourself and then recover it. Now that might seem a pointless exercise if you like, but when I mentioned that there are some supplies that are exempt, if you get businesses that are partly exempt, that means that some of the supplies they make are taxable, but some aren't. So when we get reverse charge services for a partially exempt business, they have to pay all of that on the supply to us, but they might not be able to reclaim it all back. So, so it's actually a subscription service? That's a reverse charge service, so you're probably paying a monthly or a quarterly fee, in which case then, let's say that fee was £20, you would need to account for £4 as a reverse charge. Okay. Anybody else? Or is everybody asleep? <laughs> Say in terms of your business, what if you plan to use your own car as a particular business? Then what you could do, if you, for example, on the fuel, if you pay the scale charge, that would entitle you to recover all of that on your fuel. It's it, it's what the, what the charge is for. Um, obviously, because you use it um, for business purposes, um, if you were to have repairs done to the vehicle, as long as you can demonstrate that the vehicle is insured for business use, um, then you would be entitled to recover the VAT on the, on the maintenance of that vehicle. Um, I suppose the biggest benefit is you don't have to pay... Uh, you don't have to charge any of your customers VAT, and you don't have to do VAT returns. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, not necessarily. It depends on um, what level of sales you're going to be making. If you're only going to be trading around the 60,000, 70,000 mark, uh, and you're only a one man business, then it might be worth suffering the, the VAT when you buy particular bits of equipment or whatever because then the sales you're making you're not having to charge that to everybody so it might work for some cases um, in other cases it, it doesn't work 
Um, but there's no hard and fast rule. It's, it's not a case of saying, well, if you're under 85,000, don't register. It's not worth it because that's not always true. But equally, just because you're um, under 85,000, being not that registered isn't the end of the world. Some people these days actually see being that registered as a sort of a badge that is good to wear. Uh, for want of a better analogy, they see it as a, some sort of recognition that they are they are controlled or overseen in some way, um, kind of a the sort of an honour token or something. Whether that's true, I can't say. Anybody else got any questions? Yes. How would you police that instance? So, like, if someone took said they took a staff out for a meal, but they didn't necessarily take their staff out. Out. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, business entertainment is an area that is quite commonly mixed up. So if, let's say, you've had a very successful half year and you decide you're going to take all the staff out for a, a, a slap-up meal and a night on the town, then you can claim the VAT back on the expense of that entertainment because they're your staff and they... They basically work for the benefit of your business. So it's very, very easy to see the, the relationship there. You're making, using something which makes taxable supplies. Your employees help you make taxable supplies. Taking clients out, um, yes, they are your customers. You do make supplies to them, but they're not employed or engaged by you in any way. They're just your customers. They're just your clients. And the VAT rules, you know, they, they have. There's no um, moral in, implication. They're just very black and white. Um, so if they're not employees, they can't get you can't get the VAT back on your expenses. Um, so it doesn't matter whether it's a meal, going to a, an expensive show, or whatever. Have you got more revenue in? To the 5% of the um, so that probably that's an interesting question, really, because on one side of things, because it's only 5%, we don't get as much tax in, but there are benefits on the other side. More people are actually VAT registered because of it, because it's beneficial to them. Um, the more people that are VAT registered, they're paying other taxes. So in a big treasury picture, it's advantageous. Do you think there's, there's a, another part of tax you can do with it? Because as, as a personal uh, point of view, I think it's best to have 100 people in and 5%. Well, obviously you're turned around to somebody and say, look, this is going to cost X amount of money. And you know what the first thing they said to you when you were like 10,000 pounds and say, um, it's 2,000 pounds. Well, that, that's that question completely away now. Yeah. And people just pay it. Yeah. And it's the best thing that's ever happened because uh, you know where I'm coming from. I, I do. Yeah. So, so realistically, I, just out of the question, the more honest that people have said, who's paying the back now? Uh, I, I think the we were in a very different time back in 2000 when it first came in. Yeah. Um, because there was... Um, there was a, quite a, a significant shadow economy, if, if I can call it that. Um, some people would call, it, call them cowboy builders or rogue traders. And I think today there is, there is still an element of that. Um, but what it did was there were a lot of people who avoided being that registered by keeping their turnover low. Yeah. And the advantage of the 5% rate, certainly for the building sector, was it encouraged people to actually get registered. And it also helped to stabilise what was actually quite a, a, um, a weak industry at the time. It was under a lot of pressure. Um, the, the, I mean, there were several factors in bringing in the 5% race. Um, we looked at what the level of unemployment was, and we thought that by doing this, it would actually help stimulate and generate new jobs. Um, there was also the idea of tackle, tackling the shadow economy. And 
the third thing was, yes, we might lose out a bit of VAT, but um, I don't. I I think if you look at the whole tax picture, then we're probably in the plus. Um, I, I, I couldn't swear to it because I, I've never looked at the figures in that way. But, yes, there has certainly been a lot of benefits brought by it. Um, so reduce them from a 20% where people, uh, when you told them the, the price, they'd grit their teeth and go... <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, uh, yeah. Or they would say, do we get a discount for cash? Yeah. <laughs> and at the end of the day, whichever, um, it's, to be honest, over the years, I think, Eliminated it at a more drastic rate this year. All right. You know what I mean? So I think um, I think it's been a big positive for the hmm. audience and for Very good. Uh, the industry. Okay, thank you. Has anybody got anything else they would like to ask? Okay. Yeah. If you've got a business that's wanting to register for that first yeah. time, what kind of looks like support and help them and get them registered that you would like them to or like Yeah, I mean you know, at the VAT office, um, although our public counter opening hours are only 10 o'clock until 2 o'clock, um, the office is actually open um, it, it, from 9. Um, so if anybody wanted to come in to talk about VAT to get VAT registered, or maybe they are at VAT registered and they want to uh, come in to cancel their registration, um, you can ring up or send us an email to make an appointment to come in and we'll see anybody with an appointment between 9 and 4. Um, you can always pick up the phone. Uh, you'll always get an answer between half 8 and half 4. Um, no problem there. Yeah. We don't, uh, we don't discourage uh, people popping in on the off chance. Uh, I know some, some areas it's uh, quite difficult to get to see people, but you can... It's easy to email them, but we're quite happy to see anybody, however way it is. Okay. Well, thanks very much, everybody. I hope that's been informative. Uh, at least you haven't gone to sleep, so it can't have been too bad. Thank you. <laughs>